I'm your host, Neil Howard, here on Health Professional Radio. Thank you for joining us. Our guest is Kate Finner, RN and Managing Director of Compass Clinical Consulting, and she's joining us here on the program to talk about how to prevent, detect, and remediate sexual harassment issues before they ruin your organization's reputation and possibly drain critical financial resources, especially in the healthcare industry. Welcome to Health Professional Radio. Thank you. I did say that you were managing director of Compass Clinical Consulting. Um, you've not always been the managing director of Compass. Oh, I've got a long history in healthcare, starting as a nurse and then moving into teaching and then administration, university work, and then over to Compass Clinical Consulting, where I've worked in accreditation and regulatory compliance. I have focused on a variety of those kinds of issues, and the whole topic of sexual harassment has been always simmering in the background in healthcare, as you can well imagine. Well, it's not simmering anymore, at least in uh, many industries. How is uh, sexual harassment, first of all, defined in a healthcare setting, and is it any different in the healthcare setting from what we hear in the mainstream media? Um, from a legal perspective, it certainly isn't different. Um, I, I should be clear that I'm not a lawyer, um, that my background is accreditation regulatory affairs, but from a legal definition, it is no different in a hospital, except that it, it also extends, of course, to patients as well as employees and visitors in the hospital setting. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the definition of um, harassment is very much the same. Any unwelcome advances, any creating of a hostile work environment, any requests for sexual favors and implications that a person in power can adversely affect an individual if they don't cooperate. Those all fall within and happen in hospital environments just as they do in every other environment. Now, I would think that it's a little bit more uh, complicated being, as you suggested, that it trickles down to the patients, the visitors of those patients, support staff, not just the people who are involved in taking care of the patients. How can you prevent sexual harassment in, uh, in the healthcare setting in the first place? But then how do you address it going you know, to your customers, not just the people that work there, your clients, your customers. Excellent question. The, the prevention side is um, it is step one, of course, and it's it's very strong policy. But more importantly than very strong policy, zero tolerance policy is communication and education of policy, so that. As staff join an organization, they have, as part of their required orientation, the zero tolerance policy and education about their rights and responsibilities. Every every right usually has an attendant responsibility. So that that's the prevention part. The prevention part is making sure that managers and medical staff leaders all are aware and have a similar zero tolerance policy. Um, it's also making sure that people understand their rights to a harassment-free environment, whether it's staff members or actually as patients enter hospitals, there's a requirement that hospitals inform them of their rights. And their right is to safe and competent care, essentially. Um, I see the whole issue of, of sexual harassment as being part of a larger ethical piece about why hospitals and healthcare facilities exist. We're here to serve people when they're needing us. And uh, that service includes making certain we observe their rights to dignity and self-protection. Now, we're talking about the rights and dignity of the patient as someone seeking care. We don't often hear about someone, say, coming into the insurance agency to buy insurance and sexually harassing the agent or coming into the bakery and harassing the, the chef. Is it possible that these sexual harassment issues emanate from a patient who's being who's being you know at the hospital for an extended period of time or for different types of mental or physical issues? How do we address those types of issues? Oh, you are spot on with a problem in healthcare um, because there is there are some some fairly um, illustrative court cases where patient where employees have been harassed by patients and hospitals have not taken preventative measures have not intervened and the employee has been found to induce merit of, of compensation because of it particularly with patients who may have an altered mental status. 
um, think about patients with Alzheimer's, uh, patients with mental health issues in general. But patients tend to, particularly if they're in for a while, um, they can become disoriented and they also, their, their world alters a little bit. So it's very important that we take steps when that happens, when a patient harasses a, a staff member, to intervene and explain to the patient that this is not acceptable and, if need be, reassign the staff member so that they're not exposed. What would you say are some of the uh, underlying cultural and maybe communication issues that prevent many of these sexual harassment uh, issues from both staff members and possibly patients or even visitors of patients from even being reported in the first place? Um, uh, Also a good question. Hospitals are hierarchies. Uh, there, There are centers of power. And there's also people who are in relatively powerless positions. And people who are in powerless positions frequently feel feel impeded from reporting on situations where they feel degraded or harassed. And the, the typical example in a hospital is in the operating room, where it's a very tense environment, where there are very powerful people and very powerless people. And um, there are uh, numerous instances where instances of harassment come out of ORs for that reason. It's a cultural hierarchy, and um, it's hard to report up and not feel like you're at risk for some sort of um, punishment, retribution. Yeah. Retaliation, thank you. Um, So hospitals are tough that way. Patients frequently don't see themselves as having significant rights. They are the recipients of care. They feel helpless. A lot of things are attacked in terms of what happens when you become a patient in a hospital. Mm -hmm. So they may not recognize that certain behavior is inappropriate. Or they may not feel like they have the freedom to say anything about that behavior, particularly if that behavior comes from a very important caregiver. So it's it's um, a lot of tricky minefields in the healthcare and hospital environment that don't exist in other environments to the same extent. I mean, unequal power relationships are everywhere, but so hospitals you, are particularly structured. When you have this um, this perceived and uh, very real imbalance of power in the hospital, the, the doctor patient setting. How can you make sure that this is addressed in your organization, that people feel that they do have the right to speak out and that someone will take whatever action is necessary? How do you build that within your organization? I think the important part is to prove that your policy doesn't exist on paper, to live your values so that no matter who is accused, there is a thorough, credible and fair investigation and that if the complaint is substantiated, that the appropriate steps are taken regardless of how important the individual is within the organization. Um, There's a great case that comes out of California where a transport person was accused of using inappropriate language in his responsibilities, and he was terminated. And in the same institution, a surgeon had been similarly accused, and nothing was done. You can't do that. You have you have to demonstrate that we're all equal in the eyes of this standard. Yeah. That it's it, it's just the fanciest neurosurgeon who may be tremendously skilled, but is held to the same standards around decency and comportment as the um, lowest order leader or nurses aide. Now, uh, Kate, where can we go online and get some more information about Compass Clinical Consulting and possibly some more about um, how sexual harassment is viewed and dealt with in a healthcare setting? Well, I would, Compass Clinical Consulting is at compassclinical.com and we would be delighted to have people take a look at the website. This work is oriented towards our accreditation regulatory compliance area, if they're specifically looking. Another great resource is the EEOC, the Federal Equal Employment Opportunities Commission, has tremendous documentation on definitions of sexual harassment and policies about saying what to do with it. And then also, I'm I'm going to use the acronym because I've used it so often I can't remember what the name stands for, SHRM, the Society for Human Resources Management, that's it, has some excellent training materials if people are interested 
in downloading uh, for a really minimal fee some materials. But we're delighted to talk with people about the whole prevention, detection, remediation, um, PDR, which is, if you're a health professional, that that's an old set of initials. So the PDR for around sexual harassment. Be delighted to chat. Kate Finner, Managing Director of Compass Clinical Consulting, hope to speak with you again in the future. Thank you, Neil. It's been my pleasure. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Transcripts and audio of the program are available at healthprofessionalradio.com.au and also at hpr.fm. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, listen in and download at SoundCloud, and be sure and visit our affiliates page at healthprofessionalradio.com.au and at hpr.fm.